Good afternoon. My name is Martha Nguyen, and I'm the Division Director for the Division of Policy Development in the Office of Generic Drug Policy. Today, together with my colleague, Mark Nichols, we'll be about ANDA policy considerations um, before you submit your ANDA. Um, before we begin our presentation, I wanted to give you just a brief overview on the Office of Generic Drug Policy. It was uh, established in late 2013 after the passage of GDUFA 1 so that we could provide uh, focused uh, policy support to the Office of Generic Drugs and to the Generic Drug uh, Review Program. Um, my division, the Division of Policy Development, um, advises the Office of Generic Drugs on general policy matters um, related to regulation of generic drugs. We also um, develop the policy documents that we share with industry, as well as the documents that we use internally to, uh, when evaluating um, uh, the applications. Um, the Division of Legal and Regulatory Support um, has our subject matter experts who advise the Office of Generic Drugs on Hatch-Waxman matters and on patent and exclusivity matters. They also administer the Orange Book. Today, uh, Marika and I will be speaking to you about common policy and regulatory challenges um, to consider before submitting an ANDA to FDA. Um, this includes um, considerations for identifying the basis of submission, for submitting suitability petitions, um, determining whether to submit an application under the ANDA pathway or the 505B2 NDA pathway, and uh, we'll close with um, considerations for um, that are related to RLD access, which is um, situations in which um, applicants may encounter difficulty receiving uh, sufficient supplies of the reference listed drug in order to conduct the in vivo bioequivalent studies to support the ANDA. So FDA regulations require an ANDA to contain a basis for the ANDA submission. Um, in general, when an applicant submits an ANDA for a generic drug that is the same as its reference listed drug, or the RLD, the basis for submission for that ANDA will be that RLD. The RLD is the listed drug that the applicant would rely on um, in seeking approval for the generic drug. Um, this is the drug that the uh, applicant is seeking to duplicate. And by same, we mean, among other things, and with limited exceptions, that the, the generic drug has the same active ingredient, conditions of use, route of administration, dosage form, strength, and labeling. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned, and as you may hear elsewhere throughout this presentation, there are exceptions to that. Um, but this is sort of a, a general, in general, the, this is what we consider um, an application when a generic drug is the same as its RLD. The um, drug must also be bioequivalent to its RLD. And um, a reference standard is something we call, um, it, it's the drug product that the, the FDA will select um, to let you know which um, drug the ANDA must use when conducting those studies to demonstrate bioequivalence. When the reference listed drug is marketed, the RLD um, will be selected as the reference standard for that um, reference listed drug. Where the RLD has been discontinued from marketing for reasons other than safety and effectiveness, we may in those cases select a different listed drug to serve as the reference standard. So in those cases um, where the RLD is not available, we would generally select as a reference standard a product that is therapeutically equivalent to the discontinued RLD and is also the market leader based on units sold. We may also take other considerations uh, into account, including whether the potential reference standard is approved for all strengths, the same as the RLD, or uh, whether the strength uh, there is a strength available um, that is identified in our product-specific guidance as the strength in which you should be conducting your bioequivalent studies. Although the reference standard is not part of the basis of submission, it should be identified in your ANDA. Um, 
in particular, the sections of the ANDA that include information related to bioequivalence. Specifically, it should be included, for example, in section uh, 1.12.11, which is the basis for submission statement. It should be included in 2.7.1, which is a summary of biopharmaceutical studies. In 5.2, which is a tabular listing of all clinical studies. And 5.3.1, which are the reports of the biopharmaceutical studies. And now I'll turn it over to Marika to speak to you about suitability petitions. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Martha just walked through, uh, all ANDAs need to be the same as, as their reference listed drugs in, in a number of respects. But there are some instances in which some differences can be permitted. One of those instances is, is uh, in connection with an approved suitability petition. So as many of you may know, a, an applicant may submit a suitability petition requesting the agency to consider whether an ANDA could be submitted referencing an RLD that differs in, in, one, uh, in one respect um, as compared to the RLD. So those differences that the statute permit, that, um, that, that are permitted to, uh, to be different are, are in the case of a fixed dose combination, one active ingredient could be different. Um, for all other kinds of products, uh, you could have a difference in the route of administration, dosage form, or the strength of the product. Uh, that uh, suitability petition is submitted to the agency and, and considered. Um, and we'll note that uh, an ANDA that cites a suitability petition that has not been approved, so a pending suitability petition, will not be received for review. So in order to submit an, a, an ANDA using a suitability petition, the petition must be approved. So when does FDA grant a suitability petition? And, uh, we grant the suitability petition unless the safety and or effectiveness of the proposed change of the product encompassing the change can't be evaluated or established without studies establishing the safety or effectiveness of that product. So effectively, data is sort of outside of, of what's permitted typically in, in, a, in an ANDA. We will also not grant a petition if another pharmaceutically equivalent product has been approved under 505C. So most typically, that's when you have a 505B2 that has been submitted through the B2 pathway, and I'll get into that in a bit um, in a little more detail, has been submitted and approved. Once that happens, then uh, the suitability petition requesting the same changes that have been approved in, in the B2 will no longer be approved. So sort of a corollary to that is if there is a pharmaceutically equivalent drug that has been approved, that is the route, that, that is the drug product that must be referenced for an ANDA seeking to, seeking to be a duplicate of, of sort of that suite of characteristics. Um, and an ANDA needs to reference, like I said, that pharmaceutical equivalent drug rather than using the suitability petition route. And Another thing to consider is that is that if you even even if there's an ANDA that's, that's in house and 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 um, undergoing review, if in the meantime a, a B2 or another product like I've mentioned is approved that is pharmaceutically equivalent or would be pharmaceutically equivalent to the ANDA for which you're seeking approval, that ANDA is no longer approvable. So if you're using the suitability petition pathway or considering that, these are some considerations to, to keep in mind, both in terms of things that have to happen before filing, but then also uh, what happens during the review process of your application. So as I've, I've mentioned a little bit, is, is, is 505B2 applications. And although uh, you know, the, the today and, and, and tomorrow are focused on, on the J pathway, we thought that it did make sense to, to mention B2s Quickly, um, the FDNC Act, as many of you know, uh, allows for uh, approval of, of new drugs uh, in sort of four different pathways. Uh, standalone NDAs are sort of traditional NDAs, soup to nuts, everything is submitted by one sponsor, sort of typical, stereotypical new drug application. Then there's 505B2, so I'll go into that in a little more detail, ANDAs, and petitioned ANDAs, or and as submitted with a, an approved suitability petition, as I sort of went over in the last few slides. So an ANDA, uh, as Martha mentioned, and as you've heard from Tom, and we'll hear some more tomorrow, 
uh, needs to require, uh, has a bunch of requirements. Uh, 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 in addition to bioequivalence, as, as, as Martha mentioned earlier, an A and DA needs to be the same in a number of respects. So active ingredient, dosage form, route of administration, strength has to be the same with respect to all previously, uh, previously approved conditions of use and has to be the same with labeling subject to certain exceptions. Uh, in, outside of those requirements of, of sameness and bioequivalence, certain changes, certain differences between generics and, and branded products are permissible um, as long as clinical investigations aren't necessary to establish the safety or effectiveness of that drug product. 505B2 applications are, are a little different. They're also an abbreviated pathway to approval. Uh, like 505B1 applications, B2 applications contain full reports of investigations of safety and effectiveness, but this is where they get different from B1s. B2, in, in the B2 context, at least some of the information in the application uh, that's required for approval comes from studies that are not conducted by or for the applicant and for which the applicant does not have a right of reference. So B2 applicants, in part, rely on a, a previous finding of safety or effectiveness of another listed drug to the extent that that drug and the previously approved drug share characteristics. Like ANDAs, B2s then, uh, uh, so when they're relying on the previous finding of safety and of, of effectiveness, then uh, they, uh, ANDAs, uh, B2s are like ANDAs in the sense that in that you're establishing sameness and sameness of the particular characteristics that are the same, and you rely on, on the previous finding. But like B2, application, or B2 applications, then separately must what we call bridge to the differences. So to the extent that there are differences between a, a previously approved listed drug and a B2 application, then uh, the applicant has to include data often clinical data, sometimes not, um, establishing the safety and effectiveness of the product, including its differences from what it was previously approved. So one important thing to keep in mind is that uh, an application that is submitted under 505, that any application that can be submitted under 505J should be submitted as an ANDA under 505J. So to put that in, in a bit more plain terms, an application that is seeking to be a true duplicate in every respect of a previously approved drug comes in through the J pathway. Otherwise, it comes in through the B2 pathway. So this is important to keep in mind uh, in the pre-filing context in, in that uh, it's important to know what pathway you're following. It's important to know sort of what, what the target is you're, you're aiming for. Um, and there are times when it's, it's not entirely clear to applicants which pathway they, they um, are most appropriately sort of designing their products for. Um, among other resources available, uh, we do have applicants that, that submit controlled correspondence to the Office of Generic Drugs confirming that their applications are indeed uh, available for the J pathway. Um, and so then there are some instances in which applications are not eligible to be an ANDA. Um, and some of those are, as I mentioned, it's, it's when you're not seeking to be a duplicate, when you are intentionally designing your product to be different from the listed drug. But there are other instances as well um, in which you otherwise are a duplicate, but for example, in order to, 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 um, in order to establish proper reliance on the listed drug, you need to use clinical studies that are beyond those that are allowed in the ANDA pathway. So beyond what we call limited confirmatory studies, you're using clinical data to establish the safety and effectiveness of a product, for example. Um, if you have an ANDA that can't establish sameness, for example, with respect to the active ingredient, then, then uh, a, another consideration would be the B2 pathway as opposed to the J pathway. And then the bottom bullet, I think, uh, leads to sort of the differences that I mentioned earlier, so an intentional design difference. And I'll move back to Martha for RLD access issues. Hi again. The last topic we wanted to touch on is uh, related to RLD access issues. 
As you heard in Elaine's presentation, FDA sometimes requires a REMS uh, if we determine that it's necessary to, uh, to ensure that the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks. In certain cases, um, FDA may also require elements to assure safe use in Itasu, and uh, examples of those might be, um, you know, making sure that providers who provide or administer the drug have uh, certain training. Again, this is um, uh, tied to ensuring that the benefits of the drug outweigh its risk. So, in the Office of Generic Drugs, we're aware of instances where the RLD holder, which is the brand company, um, has refused to um, sell drug product to a prospective ANDA applicant um, who wants to conduct bioequivalence testing using those uh, drug supplies. Um, and they've used, uh, cited the Ramsey Tasu as a reason for not providing the drug samples. Um, in response to this, FDA has developed a process by which we review the study protocols for those bioequivalence studies um, that are being proposed by the generic applicant to evaluate whether they provide uh, safety protections that are comparable to the ones um, in the applicable Ramsey Tasu for that RLD. Um, so I wanted to go through the process for um, obtaining a letter that, that, that uh, shows our determination that the, in fact, the uh, protections in the proposed bioequivalence protocol are comparable to those in the REMS. So the applicant, a pr prospective applicant should um, prepare and submit a BE study protocol and the informed consent forms um, uh, to the Office of Generic Drugs. Um, at present, these should be submitted through the generic drugs at fda.hhs.gov mailbox. Um, and once they are in-house, they are triaged to the Office of Bioequivalence who reviews those protocols and informed consent documents. Once the, um, the review is complete, um, the Office of Bioequivalence will notify the prospective applicant um, by a letter whether the protocols uh, do contain adequate safety measures or if, uh, if they do not. Um, th that will be uh, communicated by letter to the prospective applicant. Under GDUFA 2, um, it's proposed that this review would take place within 120 days. So 120 days after the protocol is submitted to the mailbox, um, you should be hearing from OGD as to whether the protocols are, uh, contain um, adequate safety measures or um, identifying um, uh, proposed changes to the protocol um, to enhance those uh, safety protections. Um, once the prospective applicant does receive this letter from FDA stating, stating that the protocols are um, sufficient and contain the safety protections, um, we also require a submission of a disclosure authorization form, which allows us to contact the RLD holder um, on your behalf. Without it, we can't disclose the existence of uh, your product and development. Um, once we receive that disclosure authorization form, we then issue a letter to the RLD holder stating that we do not we will not consider it a violation of the Ramsey Tasu for that RLD holder to provide um, the prospective applicant with uh, sufficient supplies of the RLD to conduct the uh, bioequivalence testing. That letter will also state the uh, amount of um, RLD supplies that is, um, that is being requested. These are some references 